Tonight, breaking news involving Donald Trump. The jury's decision just in. The stunning move late today, the jury ordering Donald Trump to pay E. Jean Carroll more than $83 million in damages for publicly defaming her repeatedly. They found he acted maliciously in attacking her. Aaron Katursky standing by live at the courthouse. Also tonight, this new storm moving in right through the weekend. Heavy rain and flooding from Texas to Georgia, all the way up the East Coast into the Northeast. What to expect after 80 degrees today in Washington, D.C.? What's now coming from D.C. to New York to Boston? Rob Marciano is here. There is also breaking news tonight. Iranian militants striking a British ship with a missile. That ship is now on fire, in danger of sinking tonight. Martha Raddatz with late reporting. There are also late developments in the Israel-Hamas war tonight. 12 U.N. aid workers accused of taking part in the Hamas terror attack on October 7th. What's now happened to those workers tonight? Matt Guppin standing by in Israel. Here in the U.S., the dramatic testimony in the trial of Jennifer Crumbly today, the mother of school shooter Ethan Crumbly. The parents who bought their son the gun days later called into school because of concerns over his behavior and what he had written. Prosecutors say they never told the school they might want to check for the gun. He opened fire hours later. Tonight, the first ever execution in the U.S. using nitrogen gas. Several other states now set to follow suit. Witnesses on what happened in that room as the convict was put to death. Tonight, Taylor Swift and the growing concern over artificial intelligence, artificial images, deep fakes, explicit in nature, seen more than 47 million times before being taken down. Tonight, the call for action with the AI threat only growing. Tonight, King Charles hospitalized, undergoing a procedure, news on his condition coming in and how he's doing. The American Olympic gold medal skier airlifted to the hospital tonight. Also, the incredible moment on the playground, the little boy, just seven, and what he said to the little girl who believed she'd been bullied. His moving words going viral tonight, our Persons of the Week. From ABC News World Headquarters in New York, this is World News Tonight with David Muir. Good evening, and it's great to have you with us here on a Friday night. And we begin tonight with the breaking news, the jury's decision involving Donald Trump. The jury of seven men and two women ordering Trump to pay E. Jean Carroll more than $83 million in damages for publicly defaming her repeatedly. They found Trump acted maliciously in attacking her over and over again. Another jury had already found Trump liable for sexually assaulting her. It took this jury less than three hours to decide the damages. Carroll's lawyers had asked for far less. The jury clearly aiming to send a message to Donald Trump. Tonight, Trump now responding. ABC senior investigative correspondent Eric Katursky leading us off outside the courthouse tonight. Tonight, the staggering judgment against Donald Trump. A jury of seven men and two women ordering him to pay writer E. Jean Carroll $83.3 million for defaming her after she went public with her accusation that he sexually assaulted her in a department store dressing room in the 1990s. Trump had already been found liable for the sexual assault. Tonight, the jury punishing him for defaming Carol by publicly attacking her again and again. Her lawyers playing examples in court. I have no idea who this one. This is a fake story, made up story. I have no idea who the hell. She's a Mr. whack President. job. But the jury was shown this photo. Trump and Carol greeting each other in the late 1980s. In closing arguments today, her lawyers asking the jury, how much will it take to make him stop? They said Trump's defamatory statements triggered a tsunami of attacks, including death threats that are now part of her daily life. Carol had testified she keeps a pit bull at home, a gun by her bed. She said the former president shattered her reputation, adding, I've paid just about as dearly as is possible to pay. Trump was not required to attend this trial, but he showed up in court four times anyway treating it as a virtual campaign stop and a way to raise money. He was here today for closing arguments, but as Carol's lawyer spoke, he stormed out. The record will reflect that Mr. Trump just rose and walked out of the courtroom, Judge Lewis Kaplan said. The former president was not in the room when the jury announced its verdict. After, jurors speared it out, driven away from the courthouse, their identities protected. Judge Kaplan telling them, my advice to you is that you never disclose that you were on this jury. $83 million is far more than what E. Jean Carroll and her attorneys were expecting, more than three times what they asked for. The jury decided that Trump's statements about Carroll not only caused her to suffer, but were malicious and made out of spite, and for that he needed to be punished. Tonight, David, 
Donald Trump says this is absolutely ridiculous and he's vowing to appeal. David. Eric Tursky leading us off. Thank you, Aaron. Now to the new storm moving in tonight and right through the weekend. Heavy rain and flooding from the Gulf all the way up into the Northeast all over again. And after 80 degrees in Washington, D.C. today, now a new storm moving into the east this weekend. Tonight, the flood threat from Louisiana up through West Virginia right now. Severe weather along the Gulf and heavy rain for the I-95 corridor, Washington, D.C., up through New York City, Boston. There could also be significant snow from Ohio to New York to New England. Senior meteorologist Rob Marciano back with us live tonight tracking it all. Hey, Rob. Hi, David. The final big wave of this very active week about to come through. It's going to make a mess of it for at least one day for most everybody east of the Mississippi. It's right now it's over Texas. The flood watches run up the, the Appalachians. Chicago, you'll stay in the soup through Saturday and Sunday. But severe thunderstorms, as you mentioned, along I-10, heavy rain, I-20 to I-40, Atlanta included. And that pushes up east into uh, northeast. D.C., you'll cool down with rain. Rain, but not cold enough for snow in New York City. But inland areas, especially in the hills, could see up to 6, maybe even 12 inches of snow. Know, but here along I-95, I think it'll be mostly wet. Kids will be back in school on Monday. David? Rob Marciano with us tonight. Rob, thank you. There is breaking news tonight. Iranian militants striking a British ship with a missile. That ship now on fire and in danger of sinking tonight. The Iranian-backed Houthi militants striking a British oil tanker, setting it ablaze. A U.S. ship rushing to answer the distress call. Here's Martha Raddatz. Tonight, a troubling escalation. Iran-backed Houthi rebels attacking a British oil tanker in the Gulf of Aden, leaving the ship ablaze and reportedly at risk of sinking, the crew abandoning the tanker. Tonight, the destroyer USS Kearney and a French warship are on their way to assist the Marlin Luanda, damaged by an anti-ship ballistic missile. Houthi rebels have launched nearly three dozen attacks on commercial and Navy ships to show solidarity with Palestinians in Gaza. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs telling me today that the nine retaliatory strikes the U.S. has already carried out against the Houthis are designed so as not to cause a wider war. When you walk this fine line of not wanting it to escalate, what would you say to those people who are your critics who would say, look, they're not being tough enough on these militants. They're not being tough enough on Iran. I would also ask, would they, do they want a broader conflict? Do you want us in a full-scale war? That's the goal is to, uh, to deter them, and we don't want to go down a path of greater escalation that uh, drives to a much broader conflict um, within the region. What is clear tonight is that deterrence is thus far not working, and in fact, these attacks on commercial ships are only getting worse, David. And much more of Martha's interview, her one-on-one -on -one with the new chairman of the Joint Chiefs coming up Sunday morning on This Week. Martha, thank you. There is also major news coming in from the Israel-Hamas war tonight. The U.S. has paused funding to the U.N. agency that is actually providing aid to the Palestinians after the stunning allegation that 12 U.N. workers took part in the Hamas terror attack on October 7th. Here's ABC's Matt Gutman from Israel again tonight. Shocking new allegations tonight against the UN's largest aid provider in Gaza. Israel submitting what it says is evidence that 12 aid workers took part in Hamas's October 7th rampage. The United Nations Relief Agency for Palestinian Refugees, or UNRWA, immediately firing those workers, saying its investigation could lead to criminal charges. Tonight, the State Department temporarily pausing funding to the agency. If the investigation proves, that in this case, I think it's about a dozen employees were assisting Hamas and even to the point of maybe even, you know, involved in hostage taking, then absolutely they need to be held to account. It comes after the International Court of Justice in a sharp rebuke of Israel's conduct of the war ordered it to, quote, take all measures to prevent genocide. The interim ruling stopped short both of calling Israel's actions in Gaza genocide or demanding an immediate ceasefire. And what does Israel say to the allegations of war crimes? War crimes families being blown up in airstrikes, now genocide. The problem is that Hamas is doing everything he can to use the population as a human shield. And tonight, Hamas releasing chilling new video showing three female Israeli hostages pleading for their release. The family's asking we only use a still from the video. And David, back to those U.N. workers accused of involvement in Hamas's October 7th attack. The Biden administration is now calling for a full and transparent investigation, but they say that the actions of a few should not impugn the entire agency.
David. Still just extraordinary if true. Matt Gutman tonight. Matt, thank you. Back here in the U.S. into the dramatic testimony in the trial of Michigan mother Jennifer Crumbly, charged in her son's deadly attack at school. The parents bought their son the gun and days later were called into school because of concerns over his behavior and what their son had written. Prosecutors say the parents never told the school they might want to check for the gun. He opened fire hours later. Here's Trevor Alt. Tonight, prosecutors in the case of Jennifer Crumbly taking the jury minute by minute through the worst school shooting in Michigan history, playing the frantic 911 call from her husband when he discovered the handgun he'd purchased for his son was missing. I think my son took the gun. I don't know if it's him. I don't know what's going on. I'm what you really freaking out. Surveillance video played in court shows the parents at the school around 11 a.m. for a meeting with their son and a counselor after a teacher discovered disturbing drawings on his math worksheet. But the Crumbleys chose not to take him home. Prosecutors showing the jury the last messages Jennifer Crumbly sent her son before he took the lives of four of his classmates. At 1221, she asks, you okay? The shooter responding a minute later, yeah, I just got back from lunch. At 1238, Jennifer says, you know you can talk to us and we won't judge. 13 minutes later at 1251, he began his rampage. The prosecution argues the day before, Jennifer Crumbly laughed off her then 15-year-old son getting caught searching ammunition online at school, texting, you have to learn not to get caught, after previously dismissing his hallucinations and cries for help. The shooter texting his, quote, only friend. Like it's at the point that I'm asking to go to the doctor, that he says, my mom laughed when I told her. The defense argues Jennifer Crumbly had no idea her son would become a murderer, pointing to this text she sent a friend hours after the shooting. I wish we had warning, she writes. He's a good kid. Jennifer Crumbly's attorneys wanted her son to testify, claiming he needs to be questioned as to whether those messages he sent were truthful. But his attorneys had made it clear he would simply take the fifth, so the judge has now confirmed this shooter will not take the stand in his mother's trial. David. All right, Trevor. Trevor Alt tonight. Thank you. We're turning now to new reaction tonight after the first ever execution in the U.S. using nitrogen gas in Alabama. Several other states are now set to follow suit. Witnesses tonight on what happened in that room as the convict was put to death. Here again, Steve Osinsami. Alabama, like every other state with a death penalty that uses lethal injections, has had trouble getting the medications to carry out those capital punishments. But tonight, they're pointing to the execution of Kenneth Smith using nitrogen gas as a way forward. As of last night, nitrogen epoxy as a means of execution is no longer an untested method. It is a proven one. Alabama has done it, and now so can you. Smith was executed because he stabbed and killed Elizabeth Sennett, a preacher's wife, in 1988. The jury gave him life in prison, but a judge overruled that sentence and put him on death row. He was scheduled to die more than a year ago, but the execution failed after prison officials struggled to get a needle into any of his veins. This time, they started shortly before 8 p.m. local on Thursday, strapping him to the table, fitting a mask over his face, and pouring nitrogen into the mask. It robbed him of oxygen, and witnesses say he was dead by 8.15. Smith appeared to violently shake, have seizure-like mo um movements and convulse on the gurney for at least two minutes. Prison officials pushed back against any idea that there were any problems. Nothing was out of the ordinary what we were expecting. One of Elizabeth Senate's sons says that justice was served. Nothing happened here today is going to bring uh, mom back. But uh, we're glad this day is over. White House officials are weighing in, calling this execution troubling. Two other states are already turning towards nitrogen gas for their executions, the states of Oklahoma and Mississippi. David. Steve Osinsami on this case again tonight. Thanks, Steve. We have been reporting here on the potential dangers of artificial intelligence. Tonight, the White House again raising alarm, this time after artificial images, deep fakes of Taylor Swift, explicit in nature. One image shared 47 million times before being taken down. Here's Ariel Reshef. Tonight, the White House expressing alarm after explicit so-called deepfakes of superstar Taylor Swift flooded social media. The administration now calling out platforms for lax enforcement against artificial intelligence. 
One of the fake images of Swift reportedly shared over 47 million times on X in what advocacy groups say is a form of sexual abuse. There should be legislation, obviously, to deal with this issue. Congress should take, uh, should take legislative action. X saying in a statement the platform has a zero tolerance policy towards such content and they are working to remove all of the images. This, the latest example highlighting the growing dangers posed by artificial intelligence as a source of misinformation, targeting celebrities and our elections. And before the New Hampshire primary last week, the Biden campaign denouncing this deepfake robocall, encouraging people not to go to the polls from what listeners thought was President Biden. Your vote makes a difference in November, not this Tuesday. That voice, not the president. It was artificially produced prompting a criminal investigation by the state's attorney general. David, legislation has been proposed in Congress that would make posting illicit fake photos like the ones of Taylor Swift a federal crime. That topic likely to come up between lawmakers and social media execs who will be on the Hill next week. David? So many hurdles ahead when it comes to AI. Ariel Reshev, Ariel, thank you. When we come back here, King Charles hospitalized tonight, undergoing a procedure. We do have news on his condition, how he's doing. The American Olympic gold medal skier airlifted to the hospital tonight. And later here, you will hear the recording, two seven-year-olds, what the boy said to the girl, our Persons of the Week. Tonight, King Charles is now in the hospital in London, undergoing that treatment for an enlarged prostate. Charles undergoing a corrective procedure today. He's expected to spend the night there. Queen Camilla says he is doing well tonight. Before his own procedure, he visited Princess Catherine, who is recovering from abdominal surgery in the same hospital there. Tonight, American gold medal skier Michaela Schifrin has been hospitalized following a crash on the slopes, one of the most successful skiers of all time. Competing in the World Cup downhill in Italy, she lost control right there on the upper part of the course, hitting the net at full speed. Airlifted to the hospital, her coach tonight saying she injured her left knee but did not suffer any serious injuries. When we come back here, the major recall tonight involving Tesla and the remarkable recording between two seven-year-olds, and you'll hear it. To the index of other news, and tonight, Tesla is now recalling nearly 200,000 vehicles because of a software problem involving the backup camera. The company says a computer glitch could actually cause the camera to go dark when the car is in reverse. The recall tonight involving some 2023 models Y, S, and X. The problem can be fixed with an online software update. Pretty easy fix. When we come back here tonight, the moment on the playground, the little boy, the little girl who said she'd been bullied, and what he did. The moment is going viral tonight, our Persons of the Week. Finally tonight here, the moment on the playground. The little boy, just seven, and what he said to the little girl who believed she'd been bullied. These two second graders teaching us all a powerful lesson. Our Persons of the Week. Tonight, the powerful moment and the lesson on the playground. Mason and Amira are second graders at Mann Elementary School in Philadelphia. Amira believed she'd been bullied. She heard someone talking about her, picking on her, and Mason with moving words for her. Just listen. Don't listen to a guy that called you dumb. Listen to yourself. Ignore this guy, whoever it is. Just stop talking to me that calls you dumb. Tell her what she is. She's, you are smart. Look, you're smart. You're fucking nice, bro. Such a nice friend, she says. Mason is just seven, so is Amira. Mason taking Amira's hand. Do you want to go play with him? Their second grade teacher, Ms. Hatala, capturing the moment. Assistant Principal Arnold Ford sharing it online. It's gone viral, moving so many who have seen it. And right here tonight, Ms. Hatala's second grade class, so formal, saying, Hi, Mr. Muir. Hi, Mr. Muir. Their teacher telling us the entire class is proud of Mason and Amira. A lot of what we do in second grade is talking about finding forgiveness in our hearts. And I think it meant a lot more to her that it was coming from him, her peer, than it did when I was saying it to her. And right here tonight, those two seven-year-olds, Mason and Amira. I want to help people, not be mean to people, no. It made me feel happy and warm inside. If someone's being mean to you, that can really hurt your feelings, and it did. But Mason helped me. And so we choose Mason and Amira. Don't listen to him. Listen to yourself, he said. I'll see you Monday. Good night. Thank you for making World News Tonight with David Muir, America's most watched newscast.